Um, it's great to be joined today by Brad Borkin. Uh, Brad is one half of um, um, the team which produced in 2017, When Your Life Depends On It, and have now produced um, Audacious Goals, Remarkable Results. We're always happy. We always try and have a book launch at the Autumn School, and obviously this is our book launch on this occasion. Um, David, the other half of the team that produced the book, is, is probably reaching for his alarm clock now in the United States, um, but Brad has turned up to talk to us. So, Brad, um, do you want to tell us a little about you know, what we're going to see in the next section? Sure. Thanks for, being, thanks for inviting me, Kevin, and it's great to be with everybody here today. The book is about three remarkable people and six epic achievements. And our talk is the first half, the first five or six minutes is me talking about the book and how we came upon these three remarkable individuals and what the book's about. And the second half comes from what we learned in the process of the, of the work. And that part of that process was understanding Theodore Roosevelt's great interest in polar exploration. And that second part is probably of great interest to everyone in the audience. So okay, that's hand it back to you, Kevin. Brilliant, uh, Brad, thanks. Um, and again, just to say, Brad and David are longtime supporters of the, the Shacklin Autumn School and so on, and we very much appreciate that. So we'll go straight into your piece now, and we'll talk to you afterwards, Brad, and some questions, I'm sure, from the audience. That'd be great. To be with all of you today, Hopefully you recognize the man in the photograph on our title slide. That's Theodore Roosevelt. And I'm gonna explain why Theodore Roosevelt's on our slide in a few minutes. But this talk is divided into two parts. I'm gonna do the first part and my co-author David Herzl will do the second part. The first part is gonna be about the book that we just co-wrote and launched, which is called Audacious Goals, Remarkable Results, How an Explorer, an Engineer, and a Statesman Shaped Our Modern World. We well, probably figured out by now that, this, that the statesman is Theodore Roosevelt. And soon you'll figure out who the explorer and the engineer are. In the second half of the talk, Dave is going to explain about what we learned during the research for this book. Because we found that Theodore Roosevelt had a phenomenal interest in polar exploration. And there will be a lot of interesting things that he'll reveal in his part of the talk. So just as way of introduction, I'm Brad Borkin, and my uh, co-author David Herzl is in the photograph leaning next to the Tom Crean statue. We actually met for the first time in 2015 at Rob Stevenson's South Poseum Number no. 2, which probably a number of you attended. And we started embarking on this endeavor to co-write a book about the life and death decisions that the early explorers made on the ice in Antarctica. And that came out in 2017 that we launched at the Fram Museum at the South Poseum 2017 called When Your Life Depends On It. And just like Shackleton, the Nimrod expedition got to 97 miles to the South Pole and thought, hey, what do we do next? We didn't quite get to our full goal. What we've got, what's the next adventure? And Dave and I sat there and said, well, what's our next adventure? And we came up with this idea. And the idea was to write about 11 epic achievements. And what we started thinking about was if you're gonna look at epic achievements across the world and things that we were interested in going beyond Antarctica, well, our interests were in the geophysical world, probably much like yourselves. We were interested in big things, daring things, things that took a lot of risk and danger. And people were at the time saying, it can't be done people, uh, endeavors that were compelling and fascinating at the same time, ultimately successful, but not guaranteed to be successful as they were going ahead. And we thought, well, the 11 things, what would they be? And we started brainstorming about railways and tunnels and the, the things you see on the slide, early aviation, all-terrain vehicles and, and various endeavors. And all of a sudden what happened was something quite unexpected. What happened was that what we discovered in thinking about these, that of these 11 endeavors, three people were involved in two or more of these. Actually, in some cases, these some of these people were involved in three of these things. So here you have 11 epic endeavors that happened anywhere from 1820 to around 1914. And you've got these things that shaped the world that actually influence the way we see the world today 
in our modern lives, but there were three people who had a big influence in making this happen. And they were, and so that started us thinking, who were these people, what made them unique, and what can we learn from them that we could bring into our modern lives? Because surely there's something unusual about these three people. So who were they? Well, one, as you may have guessed, was Roald Amundsen, because one of some of our endeavors included the Northwest Passage and, and the South Pole. Uh, it also included Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Now, he's a household name in the UK. He's incredibly famous in the UK, probably the greatest engineer who ever lived. And he lived in the Victorian era. And yet, outside of the UK, he's unknown, probably totally unknown to Americans, uh, Canadians, and, and, and elsewhere around the world. And just a phenomenal figure. And Theodore Roosevelt, who's known as a president and statesman, but well, you'll learn a lot more about him when David starts explaining his life. What was interesting about them and thinking about them in terms of their accomplishments was that Brunel built the first tunnel under a flowing river. And when you think back to the early 1800s, just the sheer fact of tunneling under a river is just without the, the tunnel collapsing on itself is a phenomenal achievement. He also pioneered railways. Now he wasn't, didn't invent the locomotive, but the entire way that we think of railways today, and when you take a train journey today, that train journey is influenced by the railway that, that Brunel pioneered. And it might also be worth saying, anytime you take a train through a tunnel, that tunnel was probably built using exactly the same technology and technique that was used to build the first tunnel under Flowing River. So whether you're taking the Holland Tunnel, the Lincoln Tunnel into New York City or any tunnel like that, all, or the Channel Tunnel between Britain and, and France, that all of that technology came from that first tunnel. We all know about Amundsen first through the Northwest Passage, something that had been sought for over 400 years, and Amundsen is the first one to do it, <clears throat> and first to the South Pole. And Theodore Roosevelt used legislation to protect land at a very vast scale. All the national parks in the United States, the most of them have their bearing that comes from legislation that Theodore Roosevelt, Roosevelt championed. And ultimately from his work, over 120 national, 120 countries have national parks today. And the Panama Canal, which is just a phenomenal undertaking. So, was, so we started writing this book that was about these six big endeavors and these three amazing people. And what we found was that there was a commonality between them. And that commonality was that they weren't perfect, that they had failures, that they, they strived and they ultimately had these glorious triumphs. That was their phrase that, that uh, Roosevelt used. He used very colorful language as you'll see when David talks. Uh, and uh, they never stopped achieving. That was one thing that struck us was throughout their entire lives they never stopped achieving. They weren't perfect, but they strive for great things. They dared mighty things. And so with that, I'll turn you over to David. Well, as we all know, uh, the explorers, the, the polar exploration takes a huge amount of effort and it takes a huge amount of money. And the explorers of the heroic era that Theodore Roosevelt was present during from 1901 to 1909, he was present during this heroic era. But the explorers understood that their expeditions really needed great support, and they were all cast as nationalistic endeavors. And that being the case, every explorer in the heroic era needed the support of his government. So the expeditions were cast as nationalistic endeavors, even though nationalism today is not necessarily a well-regarded word. Nationalistic endeavors meaning pride of country, pride of place. And as such, they needed the support of the head of state, be it the king or the president or the prime minister of Australia. They needed, they needed the support of the heads of state, the visible, verbal, verbal, vocal support of the heads of state, because it helped them with the huge expenses that were beyond the scope of most potential investors. Next slide, please. So Theodore Roosevelt, he started out, and he was born into a family of wealth, but he was a sickly child. He had asthma, and he had various kinds of things about him. And very early on, he got interested in the outdoor life. There was a book in the family library, The Boy Hunters, a young adult kind of a book. And this Boy Hunters book is really 
basically inspired much of what happened in the balance of Theodore Roosevelt's life. It inspired this interest in adventure and the outdoors. Well, also in the family Roosevelt mansion, uh, young Roosevelt was so interested in the outdoor world, he asked for his own museum. His own father founded, co-founded the American Museum of Natural History. Well, young Roosevelt founded his own Roosevelt Museum of National History. It was a shelf on the library, and he filled it with his bugs and his bees. He was given that space for himself, and he always had big ideas. And so the family vacation to Egypt, he rebranded when he was 14 as the official scientific uh, expedition in search of to enhance the collections of the Roosevelt Museum. So he had these ideas of great outdoors and being outdoors and developing himself. Uh, next slide, please. So he took charge of his own life and developed strength in body and care. So as a young, as a young man, as a young adult, he started doing strenuous physical activity and he carried this out throughout his whole life. It went as far as actually getting into boxing. So he's boxing. He developed strength in body, but also in character. He didn't just dream about things. He went and he lived things. He didn't dream about being a cowboy. He went to the West and he became a cowboy. He didn't glorify war and nobility of the gallant soldier. No, he led a war. When the Spanish-American War uh, came to the United States in 1898, he raised his own regiment and at the Battle of San Juan Hill in Cuba, he literally led that regiment from the front, his own sword flashing in the sunlight. And he continued his, his life and his attachment to the outdoors throughout his life. On the right, you'll see a picture of his cabin at Maltese Ranch in South Dakota, and excuse me, North Dakota, uh, which you will see again later in the talk. Next slide, please. So Roosevelt, as I said earlier, he had this great interest in the great outdoors. Well, he had a great interest in the polar regions. I said earlier, he was president during the heroic age, his presidency, 1901 to 1909. He was enthralled by polar exploration. He made sure that he had an opportunity to meet the big names. So he met Nansen in Washington, D.C., and he he greatly was endorsed with uh, endorsed Admiral, Admiral Peary in his quest for the North Pole, about which more later, and he met Captain Scott in London. Next slide. So he, Peary sought the support of President Roosevelt because he knew that Roosevelt would, would be helpful. And he was, in fact, because Roosevelt, or excuse me, Perry needed to build his own ship. And Roosevelt, through his various kind of financial machinations and his governmental support, enabled this to happen. Ships, as we know, cost a lot of money. On the left, you can look at this picture of the SS Roosevelt, who was named for the U.S. president, thank, in this means of thanking him for the support he'd given. If, when you stand in front of the Fram in the museum, you will see that the bow of the Fram looks very much like the bow of the Roosevelt in the picture. On the, the right-hand slide of the slide, you'll see on the top, you'll see a cross-section of a model of the SS Roosevelt. And on the bottom, you'll see the uh, design diagram of the cross-section of the Fram. And you will see that these two ships, they had very striking similarities in the roundedness of the hull and the very heavy uh, transverse bracing and the diagonal bracing. So the Fromm and the Roosevelt actually have their own sort of connection with each other, which about which more later as well. Uh, the next slide, please. So uh, Admiral Peary, Edward Peary, uh, was a, a great American polar Arctic explorer. And he's, his, his personal goal in life was to actually reach the, the North Pole, which he did claim to do eventually in 1909. And he came back and he was writing a book. And, and of course, Roosevelt was well aware of the fact that this news that Peary had supposedly reached the pole and was writing a book. And Roosevelt, unbidden, wrote an introduction and sent it off to Peary and said, if you would like to use this in your book, uh, please do so. And of course, Perry did publish the book and the Roosevelt's name is even more publicly associated with Perry right there. Next slide, please. Well, of course, in 1912, um, 
the telegram, when Amundsen reached the South Pole in 1911, and he got, and he was, therefore, he, he got back to New Zealand um, and able to telegraph the world while Scott and the, the results of the Scott expedition were still unknown because they were on their way back from the South Pole. And so th there was a year's delay there. But when Amundsen telegraphed to the world the news he had achieved the South Pole, well, of course, Theodore Roosevelt, being as interested as he was with in, in this cabled right back, heartiest congratulations. Next slide, please. Theodore Roosevelt had different associations also with the Terra Nova expedition. He met, uh, he met Captain Scott in London a few weeks before the Terra Nova sailed for her eventful South Polar expedition. Scott's photographer, Ponting, gave an exhibition of his photographs in London, and Roosevelt was there for that as well and, and had some uh, uh, conversation and so on with, with Ponting at that time. But after Scott's death, and when this news came through the world, uh, Roosevelt published an article. And it was published worldwide. And the, the article you'll see there is Polar Exploration Worthwhile. And I'm going to read us some experts of that because we had this tragedy. We had this victory of Amundsen. We had this tragedy of Scott. And it comes to the world. Is Polar Exploration Worthwhile? And I want to read some excerpts from the end of this article that was published in many places worldwide because it really expresses uh, Roosevelt's connection and his understanding to quote, there is no particular point in visiting either pole again, no particular reason for another dash toward either pole, but there's ample room for extensive, unquestionably toilsome and even dangerous scientific work. Only the boldest, the hardiest and the best equipped can undertake such work. Fortunately, says Roosevelt, there remain plenty of men of the same fine type as gallant Captain Scott, whose name is now added to the long honor roll of those who do and dare working to increase the balance of knowledge and wisdom and to extend our acquaintance with the world in which we dwell. And that's the key point. This is what Roosevelt got and that he helped to spread the word about this, to working to increase the balance of knowledge and wisdom and to extend our acquaintance with the word, world in which we dwell. Next slide, please. So I mentioned previously, there was a connection between uh, Peary's Roosevelt S.S. Roosevelt and Amundsen's from, Nonsense from. Well, after the uh, victorious, after Amundsen reached the South Pole and the from, fin when she finished her oceanographic work, uh, she was in the Atlantic Ocean and the Panama Canal was about ready to open, was going to be opening shortly. And this is another one of the, these cross connections between the, the people in our book, because there would be no Panama Canal as we know it, had not Roosevelt really driven in and taken charge of that whole project to make that happen. And here is the Fram with Amundsen aboard outside, waiting for the opportunity to be the first ship. And this would be a notable event. The Fram, the first ship, the great ship to pass through with Amundsen and with Peary on board. Well, as it turned out, the canal was delayed in opening. De Fromm was suffering from being in the, the uh, Caribbean Sea. It was getting growth and was starting to deteriorate. So the decision was ultimately made to return the Fromm back to Norway to be refit. And as we know, that refitting did not ever happen. And the ship never went through the canal to complete that second round of polar drift that Nansen and Amundsen envisioned. The, the Roosevelt, there is another connection with the Fromm and the Roosevelt and the canal. The ship SS Roosevelt actually also met her end outside the Caribbean side of the, um, the Panama Canal in 1928. So the two ships both had their experience at that canal. Next slide, please. So the, you know, now we see this cabin here again. We see Amundsen in 1927 standing outside Roosevelt's Maltese Ranch cabin in North Dakota. And if you know the United States, North Dakota, of course, is quite far north, but it's also not between any major cities. You wouldn't happen to be going by there. You would have to make a plan to depart from whatever city you were in and go to the, the Maltese Ranch. So I wouldn't call it a pilgrimage that Amundsen made sure that he got to this cabin in 1927, but it certainly isn't homage. It's, it's a 
recognition that Roosevelt and Roosevelt's public persona was so important in the development of polar exploration and the continuation of polar exploration. Next slide, please. So here we have our president again, standing beside the globe. And I'm going to read some, I told you earlier that he uh, offered to, and he wrote the introduction for Peary's book about reaching the North Pole. I'm gonna read from that, that uh, introduction right now because this again really expresses how Roosevelt got it. To quote Roosevelt, probably few outsiders realize the well nigh incredible toil and hardship entailed in such an achievement as Peary's. Fewer still understand how many years, how many years of careful training and preparation there must be before the feat can even be attempted with any chance of success. A dash for the pole can be successful only if there have been many preliminary years of painstaking, patient toil. Great physical hardihood and endurance, an iron will, an unflinching courage, the power of command, the thirst for adventure, a keen and far-sighted intelligence. All of these must go into the makeup of the successful polar explorer. Roosevelt understood and he helped the world to understand. And I'm gonna turn this slide to show back over to Brad right now. Great, thanks Dave. The, the statement on the slide also not only pertains to polar explorers, it pertains to Theodore Roosevelt himself. Great physical hardihood, endurance, iron will, and so on. What's amazing about Roosevelt is he was such a great orator. He was such a great user of words that he had fully understood the value of science, discovery, exploration. And interestingly, when we were finishing up the book, we were thinking, how do we end this book? And it was February 20, uh, February 2021, and the NASA Mars rover landed on, on the planet. On, on Mars. And the parachute that you see in the picture was the parachute that helped the Mars rover descend to the red planet. The stripes may look random, the red and white stripes, but they actually are a code. And when it was descending, the, uh, the narrator from NASA, the engineer from NASA was explaining how the landing gear and everything was gonna happen, said in this parachute is a code. And people around the world set out to figure out what the code is. Well, what the code says, what those stripes say is dear mighty things, which is a statement from one of Theodore Roosevelt's speeches. And it's a great statement for how all of the explorers, Shackleton, Scott, Amundsen, Mawson, they all lived their lives. They all did and lived and dared mighty things. So with that as a conclusion, that's our book, Audacious Goals, Remarkable Results, How an Explorer, an Engineer, and a Statesman Shaped Our Modern World. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Yeah, Brad, um, brilliant presentation. Thanks very much. Um, a few nice comments. And again, as usual, you know, new things are coming up. So apparently, um, Brida has said that uh, Brunel combined with um, uh, a famous railway engineer in Ireland, William Dargan, to build uh, the railway from Bray to Greystones, which has lots of tunnel through rock. So maybe when you're over for Shackleton Autumn School next year, Brad, we'll, we'll take you on a trip to, to see that. And I see Anika is, is just recommending your book. And um, she says that um, Brunel was included in the opening of the Olympic Games in London in the opening uh, feature in 2012. So again, just shows how important these characters are. But what I'm amazed, and again, I've been reading your book, I won't tell a lie and say I've read it all. I find it, it reads like a thriller at points. There's suspense at points. You're saying, what's gonna happen next? And um, it just all runs so well, you know? Um, Brida has also put up a photograph of uh, Brunel and Dargan um, on the Facebook feed. Um, so yeah, no, look, recommend the book, absolutely. Um, a few questions coming in, um, I suppose, in, in the light of the event we're at. Any record of um, Roosevelt meeting or commenting on Ernest Shackleton? No, we couldn't find any at all. Okay. And uh, yeah, we, we did look for that. Yeah, there, there no, that's fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about your process, Brad? I mean, I, I love the way in the book you bring us through. You know, you start off saying, I'm going to read a book. And actually, you find yourself in a process. 
Um, and it's just fascinating how it goes from, you know, we reduced it, we reduced it, we reduced it. It's just, it's just really fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Was that, was that a surprise to you? It was a total surprise. Wow. And we really did to start with basically saying, what are these big endeavors we're going to write about? We actually had a list of about 50 and we narrowed it down, narrowed it down to the 11 and thought, okay, this is great. The 11 chapters, each chapter will be about things like I've said in the, in the video, early aviation and, and early um, uh, the trans transatlantic cable and things like that. They'll all be very interesting to people like the people in the audience today, people interested in history and, and big endeavors. And it just was just a total uh, surprise that these three names kept reappearing. Re 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 and we thought, well, people actually like enjoying reading about people, actually sometimes more about reading about people and their lives and their endeavors and their failures and their struggles than even the, the, the events themselves. So that's where we moved it more to being about the people. But there were so many fascinating times they overlapped uh, even things like one of the things that, that people may not be aware of, Perry and Henson. Henson was a black man who was his assistant, second in command of his expeditions, trying to get to the Arctic, going across Greenland, different things like that. And he, uh, they actually met because per Perry was commissioned by the U.S. government to search for a route for the Panama Canal. And in, in hiring a team, he hired Henson. So this connection between the Panama Canal and polar exploration just kept reappearing in different places. And, and it was just great fun to research. Okay, no, that's, that's great. And I can, I can just hear the, the method and the process in your, in your voice and you describe it so well in the book, you know? And I just see Anne Straithy has, has sent in a comment about when she was researching her book on ponting. Again, she was amazed at the amounts of, on the amounts of occasions, the number of occasions that Roosevelt popped up. Mm -hmm. the, I think the the audience will be as just as interested in the stories of Brunel. Brunel comes near death various times. Brunel has enormous struggles, enormous failures. She nearly mm -hmm. dies in floods in the in the, mm -hmm. the building of the tunnel. There's uh, Roosevelt with the work he did to protect land and wildlife is also an amazing story. And and, and these things are as exciting as any story, any polar story I've, I've read. And so mm. I think this combination of people and things is always, is, would be quite thrilling to your audience as well. Yeah, yeah, and I just, I love the piece uh, when you talk about Brunel, you, like if, if health and safety and GDPR and things like that were around, uh, these characters wouldn't have been allowed, wouldn't have been allowed out of bed probably, you know? <laughs> That's right, precisely. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's just, uh, it's a fantastic book. I mean, I would almost say, you know, in saying it reads like a thriller, it tells a great story. It's also like a manual for decision making. I mean, I could see myself referring to it because you, you see people confronted with situations that just look overwhelming, you know. Um, I, I just see, yes, um, another fascinating piece of information from Anne, uh, who says Kathleen Scott sculpted the medal which the RGS gave, gave to Peary. Uh, just before the Terra Nova left London. So there's, there's a, an, another nice little crossed, crossed wires, crossed lines, as we often get. Brad, we're just coming to the end of our session. Um, just the best of luck to you and David with the book. Um, and again, thanks very much uh, for joining us. And thanks very much from all of us for writing the book. Oh, well, thanks very much for inviting me. And, and great to be here and looking forward to the rest of the day. OK, OK. Thanks a lot, Brad. Um, so our next piece, uh, just starting in, in a minute or two, is Angelina Foster on printing in Antarctica. And it's, it's a fascinating piece, I think, and you'll see the lens that Angelina went to, to to recreate the sort of the inks and the, the equipment that um, Ernest Shackleton would have had when he was printing in Antarctica. So that's going to be starting um, at 13.10. So that's a minute maybe or two away. And uh, just remember... Uh, when I go off screen, remember, refresh your browser for the next session, OK? We'll be picking back up again then. Have your lunch break. We'll be picking back up again at 2 o'clock with, I think it's Bob Headland. Um, and Bob, as usual, delivers a fascinating lecture. So uh, enjoy Angelina, enjoy your lunch, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.